Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo, Japan. This ADBI webinar on post-pandemic infrastructure policymaking with Professor Francis Fukuyama and ADBI Dean Tetsushi Sanobe will begin momentarily. A quick reminder, this webinar will be streamed live, photographed and recorded. By attending, accepting connection or continuing participation in the webinar, participants thereby consent to the possible use of their name, likeness, voice, or spoken or written comments by ADBI without compensation or permission. In addition, you are kindly requested to keep your microphone and video off during the presentations and until further notice. We appreciate your cooperation. With that, I turn the floor to ADBI Deputy Dean Cholju Kim, who will serve as our MC for today's webinar. Deputy Dean Kim, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants. I'm Cho Ju Kim, Deputy Dean of ADBI. I'm very pleased uh, to moderate uh, this uh, public webinar uh, between uh, Professor Fukuyama and ADBI Dean Sonobe. The topic of the today's webinar is policymaking on infrastructure development mm -hmm. in post-pandemic era. As you know, developing Asia will require a huge amount of infrastructure investment uh, to sustain the growth, but resources fall sh well short of, and thus countries surely need to attract uh, private investors. Uh, more importantly, infrastructure projects require mm -hmm. discrete skills and clear and optimal solutions in project design and implementations. Uh, for your information, uh, the four week long online program on this subject, uh, jointly organized by Stanford University and ADVI, uh, was completed yesterday. These challenges are expected to be aggravated further by the COVID-19 pandemic. A huge budget deficit, a resultant decline in infrastructure investment by government and the difficulties to attract private sectors and the cement consensus on projects among various uh, stakeholders. Uh, beyond the infrastructure, this pandemic uh, will be envisaged to fundamentally transform our economy and social life. Uh, we will have to tackle the policymaking calculus for advancing post-COVID-19 infrastructure growth and economic growth as a sustainable and inclusive recovery driver in fundamentally different and politically uh, charged environments. To discuss these very difficult issues, we have two renowned scholars, a political scientist, Professor Francis Fukuyama at Stanford University and ADBI Dean Tetsushi Sonobe. I'm very thrilled to hear valuable insights from our renowned speakers. I'm sure the audience now registered number amount to more than 800 will feel the same way. So I encourage all participants to send uh, their written questions uh, to both speakers uh, to uh, get the insights uh, from them. Without further ado, uh, I would like to invite ADBI Dean Tetsuji Sonobe for opening remarks, setting the stage of today's discussion. Dean Sonobe is a renowned development economist uh, researching on economic development, uh, particularly industrial development process and poverty reduction in developing countries. He has over 20 years experience analyzing the law of human capital, institutions, and management in industrial development in Asia and other regions. Dean Sonobe, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, D.D. Kim, for kind introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tetris Sonobe, Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute. It's my great pleasure to host this interactive discussion with Professor Fukuyama and all of you on the important topic of infrastructure in the world with COVID-19. Before the outbreak of COVID-19, the Asian Development Bank uh, estimated that uh, 26 trillion US dollars investment uh, over the next decade uh, to, uh, is needed to meet uh, those uh, big demand uh, from the European 
economies in Asia and the Pacific uh, for quality infrastructure. Uh, you may wonder what quality infrastructure is. Infrastructure is. Uh, it's defined as infrastructure that promotes sustainable growth, job creation, improved living standards, and climate change mitigation. For infrastructure to be quality infrastructure, it must be safe, durable, efficiently operated, green or friendly to environment, equitably distributed among regions, and useful not, for, not only for economically active people, but also for the vulnerable. The quality infrastructure requires good understanding of needs, deep insights into the consequences and the impacts of infrastructure development on the life of people in different occupations, economic sectors, and the geographical regions. Quality infrastructure also requires ingenious planning by policy makers, strong commitment and leadership of political leaders, and good designs by engineers, high capability of constructors, good skills and devotion of officers in charge of operation and maintenance of facilities. It is a huge challenge to gather such professionals and give them right motivation. In addition, financing infrastructure investment is obviously another challenge. Recently, Asian Development Bank estimates that COVID-19 pandemic will reduce 9 trillion GDP in the world economy and the 2 trillion uh, GDP loss in the developing Asia and Pacific. COVID-19 has added a new level of strain on government budget. Commentators might say that if government budget is so tight, why don't we mobilize private sector investors? But in order to motivate the private sector to invest in infrastructure, the investment must be very profitable. So inviting the private sector to infrastructure investment is a good thing, but it requires high profitability. And increasing profitability is another difficult problem that can be addressed only by hard work and the ingenuity of professionals. So, Large part of difficulties in quality infrastructure development is human problem, or the problems of human capital and the incentives. As you know, economics has made great progress in these two topics for the last 50 years, uh, theoretically and empirically. But there is a weak spot for them. When economists consider incentives, they tend to think of a simplest relationship between one employer and one employee. Economists are not yet good at thinking of the situation where many people with different expertise and different opinions make decisions together. Their decision making is through a kind of political process, which can be very different from the market mechanism with which economists and the economists are familiar. Economists adopted game theory, as you know, in order to overcome this weakness. But uh, there is a large room uh, for improving the game theory before applying it to understanding the variety of politics. As you know, politics is everywhere. Politics is critically important, not only in competing with other political or policy priorities to get a larger portion of government budget, but also in almost every part of the chain of decision making for quality infrastructure development. But economics alone cannot handle this important and uh, difficult aspect of quality infrastructure development. So, so for this reason, ADBI has partnered with Professor Fukuyama and his team at Stanford University's Leadership Academy for Development to provide a four-week virtual training program for policymakers from developing countries in Asia and the Pacific. The program has featured case studies, group exercises, 
and the case writing on providing pro uh, public goods, bypassing bureaucratic obstacles, facilitating investment, and the state as uh, an economic uh, catalyst. Uh, in doing so, uh, we have sought to empower policy makers to design and implement reforms that can effectively facilitate quality infrastructure projects. Against the backdrop of politically charged environment uh, compounded by the pandemic. I would like to uh, thank Professor Fukuyama and his team uh, who had to work late night because of time difference between Asia and the US, Europe, and other parts of the world. And I would like uh, also like to congratulate the training participants. While the instructors uh, work uh, late night, some participants had to get up very early in the morning to participate. I appreciate their devotion and passion as well. Uh, this uh, devotion and passion made this training program so successful. The discussion we are going to have today is a fitting capstone to the training program, and it is intended to help advance the public discourse on these crucial issues. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us today and yield the floor to uh, Deputy Dean Kim and Professor Fukuyama. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Dean Sonobe, for very enlightening uh, talks. Thank you very much again. Next, I'd like to call on Professor Fukuyama. I'm sure Professor Fukuyama doesn't need any introduction, but very briefly, uh, for, uh, Professor Fukuyama is senior fellow at the uh, Stanford University's Freeman uh, Spogli Institute for International Studies. As you know, he has written widely on issues in development and in international politics, as is the author of the acclaimed book, The End of History and the Last Man. Professor Guayama, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Dean Kim and Dean Sonobe. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to such a broad audience and I really enjoyed the partnership that we've had with the ADBI uh, for two years now in delivering our Leadership Academy for Development program. It's been a very profitable uh, program uh, and very enriching for me. Uh, this year we had to do it online, which was a challenge, but I think we uh, did do a very successful program. So thank you for that uh, partnership. So. I wanted to start by explaining why I, as a political scientist, got interested in the issue of infrastructure, because most people that deal with this uh, problem are either economists or engineers or uh, people in finance. The reason that I uh, took this up was that it seemed to me, as uh, Dean Sonobe was indicating, that infrastructure is as much a governance problem and a political problem as it was an economic and an engineering problem. Uh, I think the basic problem for most countries is as follows, that uh, infrastructure is what economists call a public good. That is to say, it is something that generally benefits uh, the society uh, as a whole, and oftentimes private parties will not have an incentive to create it, and so therefore you need a public authority to build that infrastructure. Uh, the problem is that it also creates certain concentrated harms. Uh, you have to acquire land, you have to build a wind farm in somebody's uh, backyard, you have to uh, take land in order to build a motorway, and um, you have to disrupt you know, graves in a traditional burial site uh, uh, for an indigenous tribe. And so all of these uh, are issues that political systems need to reconcile. And it's not very easy to do that. One thing I would note <clears throat> is that in many developed countries, including my own the United States, we really don't build infrastructure very well anymore. And part of the reason for that is that we have so many political players that can exercise a veto 
over any given infrastructure project that they become paralyzed. And so you have these cases like the international, the new international airport in Berlin. Uh, you have a bridge in San Francisco that took, you know, 13 years to build, um, uh, so on and so forth. A lot of big disasters, the fifth runway at Heathrow and, uh, and so forth. So um, it's, a, it's a problem that really all of us have to uh, deal with. Uh, it's a source of a great deal of corruption in the world because there's a lot of money involved in infrastructure. Corruption becomes a big political issue that delegitimizes governments and becomes a, a weapon in political combat. Uh, and so these are some of the domestic political dimensions of infrastructure. The other thing is international because infrastructure has over the last um, seven years become uh, the premier arena for geopolitical competition. Uh, as anyone involved in infrastructure knows, safeguards are probably the biggest issue that makes these projects complicated. And so these are environmental, worker safety, political consultation, uh, you know, any number of, you know, good governance, any number of conditions that are put on a big infrastructure project, and they're put there for a good reason. Uh, I think that, for example, uh, the West used to build lots of dams uh, in the, you know, in, in much of the 20th century, up until the rise of environmental consciousness in the late 1960s and 1970s. And if you look at the rate of Western dam construction, it has uh, fallen quite dramatically. And it's fallen because uh, in many Western countries, there are very strong environmental lobbies uh, that look at the long-term consequences to watersheds, to indigenous habitats, to the livelihoods of people living in floodplains. And there's been a lot of political pressure to uh, restrict and sometimes um, basically end uh, dam projects. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, if you look at the United States, uh, the single thing that slows down infrastructure in the United States um, right now uh, are basically concerns meeting, you know, various standards set in our national environmental uh, uh, quality laws that make the approval process for an infrastructure project extremely uh, long and complicated. And so when we talk about quality infrastructure, there's a, there's a kind of complicated discussion that I believe needs to happen. Many people in my country, in the United States, think, well, you know, it's the West, it's, it's the US or the World Bank or Europe that sets the standards for what's a high quality project because we have the most comprehensive uh, set of safeguards. And I actually don't think that's correct. I actually think that uh, for some very complicated political reasons, uh, our safeguards regimes tend to be overly restrictive. And uh, as a result, it's extremely difficult for Western project promoters to get things done. Uh, and you know, again, the proof of this is the fact that we don't build infrastructure very well in Western countries, in Europe and in the United States uh, for uh, very, uh, very similar sorts of reasons. And so I do not actually believe that, let's say the World Bank uh, is the gold standard for a safeguards regime. In fact, the World Bank about 10 years ago began to wake up to the fact that they were losing many projects to China because of the strictness of their safeguards regime. And so they began a, a safeguards review process that went on for a decade uh, and they, you know, they announced a new set of standards last year. I think that doesn't really solve the problem. It just pushes the problem in, you know, into a different area. Last two issues, political issues I'll mention, uh, has to do uh, with the impact of COVID, uh, which I think we'll have a longer discussion of, and then the question of global warming and uh, carbon emissions. Um, COVID, I think, you know, for obvious reasons is going to probably affect a lot of the Belt and Road uh, projects, ongoing ones. There's already this year been a renegotiation of several big uh, uh, projects in Africa and in, in parts of Asia uh, because of the financial distress that a lot of the recipient countries have run into because of the COVID crisis. And I think 
that is going to um, continue to be an issue that will take several years to work out. The last issue has to do with carbon emissions and global warming, because obviously in infrastructure is one of the biggest uh, contributors to that. You know, so obviously the, the rich world has been the biggest contributor to carbon emissions uh, up till now. But if you look at the next 30 years, uh, it's the emerging economies that are gonna be the biggest uh, contributors and particularly uh, China and India. And in fact, there's absolutely no way that the world can meet its uh, Paris uh, targets, even if the United States goes back into the Paris Agreement under a Biden administration, there's no way that we can reach those um, uh, targets without uh, substantial uh, work on the part of China, uh, especially China, but, but India as well. How you solve this collectively as a, as, a, as a global community is extremely hard because there really are no institutional mechanisms for uh, you know, countries taking very large sacrifices to their own economic prospects. You can't tell China and India, no, no, you can't get up to European or American standards of living because that's going to undermine the environment. It's, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and so I don't have a solution for that, but I would pose that as a very serious problem. So with that, I'll stop talking. I'll look forward to Dean Sonobe's uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fukuyama. A very, very informative, enlightening talks uh, touching upon very important key issues related to infrastructure development, domestic governance and capacity and political process, or international relations, or Western model, and Chinese model, and global agenda, uh, such as global warming related to uh, infrastructure development. I think those are very, very important issues. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dean Sonobe uh, to respond uh, to the points uh, made by uh, Professor Guyama as a, uh, as a working at the international organizations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, ADB is an international organization and ADBI also as a kind of subsidiary of ADB. And uh, at the ADB, uh, we don't call China, uh, China, but uh, we call it uh, PRC. So very sensitive. <laughs> So, and then ADB is uh, uh, one of the multilateral development bank. So basically it's a Western kind of thing, but uh, it's a kind of going, uh, the kind of middle way so between the PRC style and the US style or World Bank style. So for example, when the AIIB was established uh, and then ADB, uh, you know, helped AIIB because AIIB didn't have enough uh, human resources. So they couldn't assess the, you know, the, the safety or feasibility and those things. So ADB has uh, worked with AIIB very successfully. And then, yeah, I completely agree with Professor Fukuyama uh, so about the, you know, the choice of those uh, issues as uh, very important uh, or critical issues. And also the way of thinking of the importance of politics and the, also the you know, uh, pros and cons of uh, American way. For example, the, those uh, infrastructure business set up uh, too much or excessively strict rules and regulations. That would be a kind of result of uh, what we call regulatory capture, uh, which is a subject of economics since uh, uh, Stigler, Professor Stigler of Chicago, and then more recently uh, revived by the another Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Jan Tiro. And then, uh, while the Western countries are suffering from the kind of proliferation of excessive regulations in every sector, uh, including uh, infrastructure, uh, construction, those things. But uh, you know, China, our PRC, 
has been doing, in a sense, better in that respect. And then that is also uh, related to the kind of process of, uh, you know, coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. So it seems that uh, those uh, former uh, socialist and then still uh, non-democratic uh, countries seems to be doing uh, performing better uh, than some uh, democratic countries. So the you know COVID nineteen pandemic is kind of uh, you know uh, reminding us of this uh, you know strengths and weakness of uh, you know. Western style uh, governance. Okay, back to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, any any response, for, for Professor Kuyama? Yeah, uh, it's interesting uh, what Dean Snobe said about the ADB's approach being uh, uh, part way between, and I think that's right. You know, for example, um, I actually think that there's an Asian approach to infrastructure that's different from the Western one where in certain ways, uh, China and Japan are more similar than they are, uh, more similar to each other than they are to, let's say, the World Bank, because, um, you know, the ADB tends to offer projects as a big package, the way the Chinese do, where the financing and the contractors and uh, all of that is, is kind of organized uh, ahead of time. Uh, whereas, you know, the World Bank insists that there be separate bidding on every single stage of the project and, you know, open source, uh, um, uh, you know, bidding open to, to, uh, to anyone. And I think, you know, the, one of the questions for the future is whether the ADB and, you know, other multilateral organizations can actually meet this challenge by taking, you know, the, the purpose of the safeguard seriously, but you know, modifying them in ways that are suitable to the local conditions of the countries that are receiving uh, the investments uh, so that countries are left with some other choice other than, you know, um, other than simply going with the lowest cost uh, bidder. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, the uh, let me uh, to shift the gears uh, toward kind of the impact of the COVID-19. Uh, as you know, we are struggling with the pandemic and uh, we are talking about new normal after the, the, this pandemic uh, of news. So what do you think the impact of a pandemic uh, will be in the future uh, in term, not only in terms of the infrastructure development, uh, but also our economic and social uh, behavior, social lives. and inclusive and sustainable the growth. Pro uh, Professor Kuyama. Well, uh, let, me, <laughs> let me begin my answer to that by saying that I think it would be very foolish to make very precise predictions for how this uh, crisis is going to play out over the long run. Uh, you know, if you think about an event like the Great Depression uh, in the early 1930s, uh, we didn't see the full consequences of that for, you know, 10, 20 years afterwards. I mean, it led to the rise of Hitler and uh, Mussolini and then to World War II, but then also to the rise of the United States and, you know, a very different world after the Second World War. Uh, and nobody would have predicted that, I think, at the beginning of that crisis. And same thing with the financial crisis in 2008. I think that there was actually a clear connection between that crisis and the rise of populist political movements in many Western countries, including the United States, Britain, Hungary, Poland, uh, and so forth. And again, nobody would have predicted that at the time um, uh, that the crisis first emerged. And so I would say that there are probably going to be a lot of so-called black swans where uh, things will just emerge, like you could have a new religion or a new cult or a new, you know, conspiracy theory that suddenly becomes politically very powerful that emerges out of nowhere, you know, uh, 10 years from now that really nobody was able to predict um, simply because that's the way that, you know, I think human affairs um, 
uh, operates. However, uh, I do think that there are some things that are a little bit more knowable if, if the time horizon isn't that long. Uh, and again, you know, one of them is really the shift of geopolitical power to Asia. Uh, in response to the epidemic, the, the region of the world that was the most successful by far in containing the virus has been East Asia. It's a matter of several things that are shared by many governments in Asia. First is really good state capacity. Uh, there was a learning process as a result of the SARS epidemic in many Asian countries. And so you had health ministries that were prepared. They had the necessary expertise, uh, uh, the necessary capacity and acted very early to contain the disease. Uh, I think there was a higher degree of trust in the state, uh, but most countries in Asia, you know, I think have a kind of respect for the state that, that doesn't exist. You don't have this libertarian fringe uh, in, in Asia that you do in the US and in some uh, European countries. And I think that means that the response in general uh, has been worse. I think there's actually a correlation between being a populist and having a poor pandemic response because a number of populist governments in Brazil and Mexico and the United States have really had pretty poor results in, in dealing with this. And I think that probably is related to something intrinsic to populism, which <laughs> is basically populist leaders not wanting to really face unpleasant situations. Uh, so there's gonna be this shift of uh, economic and therefore political power uh, to Asia. There's been an effort to diversify uh, sources of supply to make them, to make supply chains more resilient uh, rather than simply efficient. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the, the COVID epidemic is probably gonna contribute to that process. Thank you very much, uh, Francis Guillermo, for the very insightful the assessment of the, the future the after the after pandemic. Uh, in the meantime, I encourage all the audiences, uh, please uh, send your questions uh, through the Q&A box uh, with your name and title, and then the questions very, very, <laughs> very short <laughs> so for the interest of time and so on. So now I think now it is time to open the floor for the questions and the answers. We have around 20 minutes. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we have received the pre-written uh, the, the questions. Uh, also, the, there are many uh, there are, uh, the participants from the academia and journalists and then ADB and then also the private sectors and so on. So. Uh, among the three uh, written uh, the questions, I'll choose one uh, from the from the, the Dr. Jean Mark Blanksa, who is the ex executive director, uh, SHE Wrong Center for the Study of the Multinational Corporation, uh, Independent California Think Tank. Uh, he posed question about the infrastructure, so he said. It is easy to talk about quality infrastructure. How do you get countries to embrace it, uh, given many want infrastructure to be done quickly and cheaply? So this is a matter of the timing and then the quality of infrastructure. So I think uh, that Dean Sonobe can answer this question. So is it a question about the quality infrastructure in the US or developing? Uh, developing countries. Developing countries. Yeah, so how uh, developing countries can quickly uh, establish quality infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quality infrastructure, as I said, requires a lot of human resources. So the, uh, building human resources is the first step. So if you skip that, then it, it will uh, be impossible to build uh, quality infrastructure. So the more international cooperation, uh, technical cooperation, including those the training programs. But currently, uh, it's very difficult for the international, you know, uh, organizations and the bilateral uh, development uh, agencies cannot uh, uh, do it very well because uh, the previous uh, business model of uh, sending the experts to developing countries uh, it's not working now. It's impossible to, to send people. So 
it's a great challenge, but uh, I believe the you know uh, human resource development is the first step, and then you cannot skip that. Thank you. Thank you. So related question uh, is from the Manju Kumar from the India. Uh, he said in India. Uh, the, we are facing a situation of choice between the development and environmental issues, uh, use of the conventional energy resources and clean energy resources, uh, domestic populist concerns and international standards. So then how can developing countries balance uh, these paradoxes for sustainable development? Uh, Professor Yukuyama, can you uh, respond to this question? Well, you know, uh... I don't think that there's a, at all an easy answer to that. Uh, in India's case in particular, coal has been, you know, uh, the prime energy resource that they have a lot of that could be uh, developed much more uh, efficiently than it is, than it has been in uh, the last few decades. And uh, a lot of economic growth could take place in India if, uh, if they exploited coal, but as I said, that's going to uh, lead to, you know, contribute very strongly to the global uh, carbon emission uh, problem. And it's very hard to say to India, you know, no, you shouldn't grow uh, because of the effect that this is going to have on, you know, the Arctic um, or, or other places. I think that part of the solution to this really has to do with making sure that uh, you know, there's a full representation of uh, voices within uh, India itself. I mean, India, you know, remains a pretty good democracy. I mean, there have been, I think, some problems in, in uh, the last few years, but it still remains a place where people can mobilize and debate. And, and it's important, you know, to realize that there's not a single voice in India that says, well, we want economic growth at all costs, regardless of uh, environmental impacts, that there are, you know, people that, that care about um, uh, issues like environment. And I think it's important to make sure that those uh, voices are represented within uh, the political debate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, now uh, that, uh, yeah, please. So for me, yeah, I agree that there is a trade-off between environment and development. But uh, by uh, utilizing the you know new technologies, you can relax that uh, trade-off, mitigate uh, you know the difficult choice. So uh, the better technology must be developed and applied. But for that, the you know uh, government and the you know, constructors and uh, you know people have to be you know, motivated you know there must be a good uh, incentive system but uh, you know incentive is difficult to emerge because uh, you know you, you pollute but uh, you are not charged so there must be a you know good incentive system like a, a well designed the carbon tax system and those things but uh, this must be a kind of international one so international leaders, political leaders, have to you know, commit this kind of idea, and then they have to make a, a good rule, international rule. Then the incentives uh, for developing technology and using technologies uh, will be uh, will emerge. So it's a kind of matter of the leadership of the world. Okay, yeah, yes, I fully agree to this matter of the readership, not only in domestic arena, but also in international the community uh, to take forward uh, global agenda. Uh, the AP, uh, Yuri Kageyama, are you there? Yuri Kageyama, are you there? Can you? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm yeah, here. Yeah, please uh, the, uh, mention the, your, your name, your title, and then the questions, who you are directed to. Yeah, I'm Yuri Kageyama. I'm a reporter with the Associated Press. I'm based in Tokyo. I have a question for Ms. Uh, Dr. Fukuyama. Um, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting you said that the Great Depression or the 2008 uh, Lehman crisis had these profound effects on, and unexpected effects on how infrastructure and as well as social and cultural things played out. 
decades later. And you seem to be pretty confident that the pandemic is going to have some kind of effect on how we shift infrastructure or how we think or, you know, some sort of kind of profound humanity change. How can you be so sure of that? Because pretty soon we might have a vaccine. And um, so what if, you know, the economies are going down right now, everybody's kind of shrugging it off as a temporary thing. What is so, I guess, entrenched or basic or profound that you see in the pandemic? I mean, besides the fringe conspiracy theories that, we, that you know, always, and but you're always going to have those kind of people, you know, um, seeing conspiracy in everything. Uh, I'm just curious, like, I mean, is, it, mm -hmm. is the pandemic that, you know, that groundbreaking or history changing? Or is it just another disease that, I mean, you, you, do you get yeah. my question? No, yeah. I, I understand. No, I, you know, yeah. I wasn't necessarily arguing that I know that it's going to have a very profound effect. Uh, but I would say two things. First of all, I suspect that COVID is not going to be the last pandemic that we're going to experience uh, because I think that these diseases are, you know, the people that follow this closely have been predicting this for years. Uh, and so it shouldn't surprise anyone that it happened. And once we f find a vaccine, there will be another one. And this one could be even more, you know, even more uh, deadly. Uh, but I guess my feeling that there is going to be a big consequence is really less from the disease itself, but from the economic consequences that it has already uh, had. You know, it was slow to develop in many developing countries. So in India or in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, in, in April and May when Europe was doing so badly, it didn't look like they were being very strongly affected. But now, you know, they're really in, in big trouble and they're going to suffer, you know, very severe uh, 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 losses of output uh, and it's going to cast, you know, hundreds of millions of people back into poverty and reverse the gains that we've seen over the past uh, 15 years in much of the developing world. And it's just hard to imagine that you can have an economic impact of that scale without it producing, you know, larger follow-on effects. But what those are, I, you know, my main uncertainty is it's just very hard to make any specific predictions about how that plays out uh, politically. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, can you hear? Yeah, Anthony. Okay, so uh, can, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah, you can hear me now. Uh, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Very good. All right. Well, I'm going to restrict myself to one question, to Professor Fukuyama or whoever wants to answer it. Basically, the pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, presumably, is going to affect infrastructure spending priorities. I mean, there's enormous emphasis now on digital infrastructure, the need for uh, digital communication, also um, the need for sp medical spending to cope with the uh, coronavirus and so on. So I wonder, given that um, you know, financial resources are limited, whether you think there's going to be a shift in spending priorities between the different categories of infrastructure? Uh, yeah, well, in a way, there already has. Um, one thing that's quite notable is how these big technology, these big American technology companies have been just going through the roof during the pandemic because everybody relies on the backbone that they provide through the internet uh, for shopping, for education, for communication, you know, for, for virtually everything. And so I think you're already seeing this, this shift. You know, I, I've been reading these discussions among people in the airline industry and the travel industry more generally. I think a lot of people have realized that it's just stupid to get on a airplane and, and travel for 12 hours, you know, to a different time zone, wake up groggy, go to a, you know, a two hour meeting and then get on an airplane and fly back, you know, quite apart from the, all the carbon that you're emitting by, by, by doing that. I, I have to admit, I, I've done this sort of thing myself uh, in the past. And I think a lot of people are going to realize, you know, why bother with that? Uh, and so I do think that there's going to be a big acceleration of the shift, you know, to online that is really not going to change even when it becomes safe to travel and, and meet and, and 
you know, have more direct uh, human contact. And that obviously has big implications for, you know, a lot of future investment in airports, you know, and other things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any points, Ding uh, Sonobe, you want to add? Uh, yes, so already the shift is uh, occurring uh, to, toward uh, digitalization, but uh, uh, to go forward, uh, there must be, uh, you know, great effort to uh, mitigate or reduce a digital divide. So to uh, equip those vulnerable with uh, good uh, access to internet, that kind of thing will become more and more important. Also the consumer protection, privacy, in invasion, prohibition, and so, those things. Uh, and also the, uh, even the transportation, and then also the construction of industrial zones, those things will be strongly affected. Uh, maybe the priority uh, and also type of infrastructures or meaning of quality infrastructure will change. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So there is one question from the Nepal, Joint Secretary of Government of Nepal, uh, Mr. Sharma uh, Saproka. Uh, his question is that how can we control escalation of costs and taking huge amount of commission uh, from contractors by political elites in developing countries? Uh, Professor Guillermo, you, you might uh, answer this question. Well, actually, I think that uh, Dean Sonobe might be in a better position <laughs> to say something about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the question is, uh, what is so the increase in the cost of construction? Yeah. Yeah. The consultants, though. At, at least in the you know, short run, yeah, it's difficult to avoid it. Yeah, also, uh, uh, how, how can we deal with kind of this, some kind of corruption uh, related to political elites in the infrastructure development? Well, that's uh, Professor Fukuyama. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, I've been working a lot on this corruption issue over the last few years. Uh, there's really no way to uh, seriously deal with generalized corruption, you know, that pervades all aspects of you know business dealings in in many societies but i do think that it is possible to uh, reduce levels of corruption you'll never eliminate them but i do think that if you focus on particular areas you can reduce the level for example in procurement you know procurement is one of the biggest sources of corruption and if you move to an e procurement system uh, where bids have to be publicly, you know, put up on the internet and people can investigate them and the bidding process itself is laid out very clearly, um, then that, you know, uh, makes it harder to skim money off the top, you know, if you're a, a, a corrupt official. And I think that this can apply to procurements in infrastructure. I mean, those procurements are huge and I think more transparency but not just transparency, there has to be an accountability mechanism where, you know, if you're caught uh, uh, violating rules, there's really some big consequence. Uh, and if you design that system and focus it on a kind of micro level, like one project, uh, then I think you can actually make some, some progress. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that there are many more questions, uh, but time is too short to, to accommodate all. So now, now it's time to close uh, this webinar. So with the one hour talk, I believe that we are able to get the invaluable insights on infrastructure development, impact of pandemic, international relations, and new normal after the pandemic uh, from uh, Professor Fukuyama and Dean Sonobe. Uh, please uh, join me in deeply thanking our two renowned scholars for such enlightening and insightful talks. Uh, with that, uh, let me close this webinar. Uh, then the, just the announcement, uh, audience uh, can continue dialogue uh, after using the chat function uh, after the officially ending uh, this webinar. And also ADBI will make this webinar recording available uh, on the ADBI website. You can uh, refer to this uh, recording anytime. So with that, uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh,
uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.